My name is John Fultz, and I'm here to talk about some of the new things in the version 11 user interface. Probably the first thing to note about the user interface is that we have, at long last, moved on from Courier to a new selection for coding fonts. Courier was a very serviceable and venerable font for its day, but display technologies have improved, and most coding editors have tended toward more modern-looking sans-serif fonts. Many Macintosh coding editors use Menlo, but on Macintosh we decided to use a font called Source Code Pro instead. It has many similarities to Menlo, but visually it works better for our use of boldface inputs and plain style outputs. On Windows we use Consolus, another very popular choice for use by code editors. Another place where we made a significant change is in the styling of messages. At first glance, you'll notice that we made the messages a little less techy in their presentation. The message code, which looks like an excerpt from a 1980s assembly language program, is now hiding behind a mouse over. Also, there's a pop-up menu that includes, among other things, a much more powerful tool for finding the source of your message the stack trace. A stack trace is basically a roadmap beginning at the top level of the code you executed and from there winding down the rabbit hole of your code as it was run by the system. In this case, the stack trace wouldn't be very interesting. But on the next slide, it's a bit more useful because it's difficult to reason about exactly where the one over zero pops out by merely eyeballing the code. If we look at the stack trace, we can see the relationship of the functions to one another as they're being executed, and pretty quickly figure out where the 1 over 0 is popping out. Another significant update to the system is real-time spell checking. Now let me preface this by saying, don't worry, you won't normally see misspellings marked in a slideshow as you're presenting. I've just turned them on here for illustrative purposes. Real-time spell checking is something you see in a lot of software. You might wonder why it hadn't made it into our system before. One of the interesting things about real-time spell checking is that it compels you to bring your A game to the spell checking business. Because if you have systemic omissions from your dictionary, those red wavy lines are going to show up everywhere in people's documents. For example, the better systems out there today have evolved enough to understand that spell checkers need to have things other than the standard language you're working in. They need common names of people, cities, businesses, and other entities. But our software has even greater needs. Since we're used in so many different technical domains, we need to understand a lot of highly specialized jargon. And you can see some examples of both of those things here in excerpts which I stole from Wikipedia. With some misspellings, which I can easily fix by mousing over the word and choosing the best option. What we have in version 11 is still a bit of a work in progress, but we have a lot of good data to draw on when you look at what we've done with Wolfram Alpha. I think what we have in version 11 is a pretty impressive effort, and there's a lot more coming on this in the future. And not just in English either. We're supporting over 25 languages in version 11, and we are putting continuing curation effort into improving the existing dictionaries and adding new ones as we go forward. This is something we're very committed to. It matters to us that our internal and personal documents are clean of the red wavy lines of spelling death, and we would like to hear input from our users as well. I also wanted to mention a couple of features that aren't brand new in version 11, but were introduced in releases after version 10. We were just speaking of internationalization, and something else we've done on that front is a feature we call code captions. Here's the idea. Like many programming languages, the Wolfram language is fundamentally skewed to be more usable by those who read and write English well. We think hard about the names we give things, and we like to think that we do a very good job of name selection, but that doesn't help you if your English skills are poor or non-existent. Some professional folks may get by on memorization, perhaps, but 
that's not so helpful when you're wanting to change your national education system to heighten code literacy in a population of non-English speaking students. So we came up with the idea of introducing captions, a bit like subtitles in a movie. Here I'm showing the French code captions. Some of the captions get clipped, but they pop out when you move your mouse over them. If you have code captions turned on, they'll show up everywhere code shows up, even in the help system. By default, the system will detect your default language, but it's easy to override in the preferences dialog. Another feature which isn't new to version 11, but postdates version 10, is notebook imports. Notebooks have long had the neat property that they are simply expressions in the Wolfram language, and so documents are easy to manipulate, but it still requires a high degree of knowledge about the specifics of the notebook format. Notebook import lowers that bar. Let's take a look, for example, at the task of harvesting all the hyperlinks from a notebook. This was possible before, but it would have required figuring out appropriate patterns and probably messing with the level spec argument to cases. Now I can simply call notebook import and tell it to look for the hyperlinks. I can do all sorts of these manipulations with notebook import that would have been possible, but modestly challenging before. Here's another one that's now easy. Maybe I want a list of section and subsection headings so I can automatically create an outline. No problem. In fact, here's the outline for the notebook I'm currently presenting from. And as you can see, I've hit the last of my headings, so I guess that means I'm finished. Thank you for your time.